welcome here to Clichy, uh, Vermont, spending the Labor Day weekend at the Hot Air Balloon Festival. I wish you guys were here, it's very nice. Uh, lots of shopping, music, different activities, lots of food obviously, as is usually the case in these fairs. And I wanted to do a little video tutorial for you, but uh, obviously as you can see it's pretty crazy out here, too much noise, so that's not going to happen right now, but I'm heading out after this. Um, oh, I can see you. All right, so now that we're inside, let's talk about this uh, clinical case that I have for you. This is a surgical case, as I mentioned, and this surgical case is unique only in the sense that uh, it involves doing a parallel surgery, which is not so common endodontically. Most of endodontic cases, maxillary molars that end up failing uh, on the paddle root. First of all, they don't fail as often on the paddle root. Most failures are in the buccal roots and primarily because of the ribbon-shaped anatomy of the mesobuccal root and sometimes the distal buccal root. Uh, where you get failures on the paddle roots is uncommon because that generally is a larger and straighter root that could adequately and not quite oval is fairly round so it does match the shape of our files and it does tend to do well on uh, files so what we end up happening in these parallel roots oftentimes is uh, causes of failure are either due to a situation in which you may have a parallel root like this that comes down and then you may have a lateral canal of course in a small percentage of cases you may have a true type 3 canal uh, on the paddle root in which you have two separate canals and I've seen some of these as well clinically and uh, uh, people oftentimes find only one of the canals and it ends up not being fully uh, treated and the persistence of a lesion may be present in these types of cases. So what we want to do in, in this case in paddle roots it's primarily we want to be able to retreat and revise these cases and only do surgery on those cases in which the type of revision is not indicated, it's not possible due to a very, very large or dangerous type of a post, such as a big screw post, if you will, that is very deep. And in those types of cases, what we end up doing is recommend doing surgery only in specific situations. And those situations on which uh, a uh, surgery is possible anatomically. And what am I talking about is the main problem and the main reason people don't do surgery on the paddle roots as often as they do on the buccal roots is primarily due to access. It's not because it's a clinically difficult tooth to do surgery on. It's primarily because clinical access to that site is very difficult towards the palate that deep. Now, periodontists do a lot of scaling root planing on buccal and the lingual on the paddle side, but they're staying fairly coronal at the cervical area of the tooth. In order to reach the apex of the tooth, you really need to reflect the entire flap uh, on the palate, uh, kind of open that up, and then you have very difficult access in terms of seeing up the patient's uh, palate. In these cases, you really want to make sure that your patient is almost in Trendelenburg position in which they're really sitting on their head and you're looking down into their um, mouth and, um, and into the palate. But the main indication and the potential treatment planning decision that you're going to need to make for someone being a candidate for doing apical surgery on the palate root is two things. Number one, is the length of the root. Obviously, if the root is shorter, it's easier and better because you have, as you as I just explained, you'll have a little bit uh, more coronal access to that root. So that's number one, if you have a shorter root compared to a much longer root. And then the second uh, reason for doing, um, for an indication is essentially that the depth of the paddle vault. So when you have a deep paddle vault, as you can see here, you end up having fairly good access to the apex through the palate. So you can actually make an opening there and be able to get in and do your surgery. The more difficult situation is in which where you have a very shallow paddle vault that is that makes it so that you have to go through a much more bone to get into the area and that really reduces your visibility because you're unable to see quite in this direction and then you have to go in and then up that makes things fairly difficult so a long route 
and a shallow palate is probably the most difficult because there is a lot, a lot of bone you're going to have to go through in order to get through and be able to do your preparation, uh, retro preparation, and then also difficulty would be your retrofill. So in these types of cases, what you want to do is you want to do a good job of doing your treatment planning. So you definitely do need a CT and the CT is going to show you what kind of a situation you have. The other issue that you run into with the paddle surgery is the presence of the greater palatine neurovascular bundle that comes out if you look at the palate. So let's just say these are the teeth here um, and these are the molars. So on the palate, you have your greater palatine uh, neurovascular bundle that only supplies the soft tissues of the palate of the palatal mucosa and the uh, and so on and it comes out and it comes all the way up to the maxillary suture line so you end up having this type of a intervention uh, or innervation of the of the soft tissue remember that the paddle root itself is innervated by the posterior superior alveolar nerve so it's not through the greater palatine artery it's on the other hand it's from the posterior superior alveolar um, nerve foramen that comes uh, out there so the difficulty with this is understanding this main neurovascular bundle where it is so that when you're doing your surgery you're not coming too close to it most of the time the exit of the greater palatine artery is fairly close to the palatal root of the maxillary second molar so palatal root of maxillary second molar surgery on the palatal root of maxillary second molar is probably not a very good or safe idea one of the things you can do in these types of cases if you're doing palatal root surgery and you want to be on the safe side is because if you do nick the greater palatine artery you're going to end up getting a lot of uh, hemorrhage you want to make sure that you have you can make yourself ahead of time a template or a type of an acrylic template without teeth that can go out here because in these types of cases if you end up having it just pressure would be the way you're going to want to try to control the bleeding of course if you can actually see the greater palatine artery you may want to use a hemostat and clamp it but if you don't uh, and you just have hemorrhage going on during the surgery, having a, a template made ahead of time uh, would be very helpful as to the patient, almost like a maxillary denture without the teeth itself, just the panel portion of it. You put that in and you put pressure and you hold it and that really helps. All right, so now we went over the indications and the contraindications of the maxillary molar panel root surgery. Again, deep vault and short roots are the ideal situation and then a combination of which. But a shallow vault is generally a very poor indication for doing parallel root. In those types of cases, you wanna do revision to, uh, to the extent that is possible. And also in some cases, just resort to moving to re removal of the tooth and do extraction as a better option than doing a picoectomy if you cannot have a proper revision, which can happen from time to time. All right, so let's quickly take a look at this uh, case that we have here. And then discuss some more. So here is this patient that came in with a maxillary uh, root canal that had been done previously and there is uh, no lesions uh, around the buccal roots but there is a lesion around the paddle root and that is usually what we want to do is we want to go in there if there is a post and there isn't really a post here in this tooth so a paddle root uh, as you can see, there is some type of a J-shaped lesion around the paddle root, and these are always suspicious when you see a J-shaped lesion. Now, it is not pathognomonic or 100% a uh, type of a confirmation that you're going to have a crack in a tooth like this, but when you see a J-shaped lesion, always be aware and discuss that as an option, as a potential with a patient. So in this particular uh, route where you have the lesion limited to the paddle root and you can see, I decided to first go in there and do a targeted paddle root revision on this tooth. So we only did the revision on the paddle root and you can see what I did is I enlarged the apex to a much larger size, did two weeks of calcium hydroxide therapy and went in there and did a, um, the, a revision, filled the whole thing up with calcium hydroxide and, uh, first and then the biceramic cement we had a fairly large uh, extrusion as well but after three months the patient came back and there's still a sinus tract going on on the paddle root and the lesion has not changed if anything it has actually expanded when you see that and you can see it's fairly large um, uh, cratering of this j-shaped lesion i already was expecting a uh, kind of a crack in this tooth and if you look at the uh, 
the coronal section, which is the section that you're going to always use in order to determine what you have. You can see right there is the groove for the greater palatine neurovascular bundle right there. So it is close to the apex, but a tooth like this where I'm suspecting potentially a vertical root fracture, and don't forget that vertical root fractures start from the apex up. So I would go based on my original resection, at which point I would be going six millimeters uh, distal from the, crest, from the crest of the bone. So that's not that deep, it's doable. And if it, I see a vertical root fracture that because it starts from the apex, it does come up, but I can somehow get to the point where I no longer see the crack, I can cut that off. And at that point, that would be about halfway up where the lesion kind of seems to kind of narrow down. That's also only about six millimeters in. So it's certainly doable. And this patient was very motivated in trying to save this tooth instead of doing a, an extraction. And um, so here's the sinus track. You can see that was the point of um, the, um, uh, the, the, the that's where we're having a little bit of drainage. So the reflection of the flap, as you can see here, as I mentioned before, you're going to want to make sure that you go up to the premaxillary suture line because that's where the greater palatine artery starts to kind of dissipate and you don't have a problem there with putting the vertical that's a safe place for the vertical you don't want to put the vertical too early on the premolars because you can potentially cut right through the neurovascular bundle a little trick is for reflection because it's so difficult to see what you're doing is you can put in a preliminary suture on the paddle a flap and then tie it off to the other side that will help reduce some of the tension on the flap and on your hand and here i'm using a minnesota and i've made my crypt and access opening and you can see here with a 45 degree angle i'm going in there and i'm cutting on the side of the root i can see that j-shaped lesion and right at the apex there i kind of do see there is a vertical uh, crack that's going on and so what i decided to do is i decided to first cut the root at the apical one-third and then I stained the tooth, but I realized that that stain was coming up a little more coronally. So I did end up cutting the root fairly short. About halfway of the root was cut off here. And then at that point, I could no longer see the crack. So I decided that that would be a safe place to stop. And what I did is I resected the root first, staying away from the apex. There's two different ways to do this. You can either resect the apex or you can grind out the apex. I, I resected it and now you can see that I've removed the apical segment. And you can see I don't see any biofilm inside the root and that's very nicely filled so the problem was on the outside from vertical root fracture and then I'm using my um, surgical uh, ultrasonic tips to prepare uh, do a retro preparation and then I'm using now the lid technique to fill this and the lid technique involves the placement of the sealer followed by placement of the putty on top of that and then washing it out so now let me quickly take a little uh, moment to explain to you the lid technique and how that works and the way that lid technique uh, will work here is that uh, essentially what we have is, let's say we have this paddle root that we were dealing with, and it, is, it has got a percha in it. And what I do is I'm cutting this off now, and let's say at the retrofill. In this particular case, it was much shorter. And what we did is now we're left with this type of a presence. Uh, you can see the gutter percha right at the apex and um, the outline of the root, which you could use methylene blue to stain, make sure there are no more cracks or you know what is the actual outline of the root. But nowadays with the CBCTs, you can do all of that ahead of time, have that pre-planned to know what you're dealing with and what kind of a shape, anatomical shape you have in the axial section. So once we do that, I'm now using my retro prep tip, which is a diamond coated uh, ultrasonic tip, which will go inside here. And the idea here is that you want to expand this still a little bit more than what the gutta percha is, because what that does in this process is you're making sure that there is any remaining biofilm on the canal walls you've removed. So you want to remove still a little bit of dentin. You're not just removing the gutta percha, you're removing a little bit of dentin as well. And so once you have done that, now you're left with a um, a retro preparation that is at least three millimeters. In some cases, you can even go longer with some of the longer retro filling tips, uh, retro preparation tips that are available. And uh, this retro preparation will now allow you to cork the end of the root close just in case there are any remaining bacteria left in here that would want to get out. So the concept here is in the uh, idea of making sure that you cork the root end close, putting a cork like a bottle. Uh, if you have a wine bottle, you're putting a cork in it to prevent any other 
content to get out. That's the same thing that you do in a retro filling. And uh, now the question becomes, what is the best way to fill it? Traditionally, we started by using amalgam and then we went on to even use composites and so on. And then MTA came around and MTA was an awesome product for doing this. Part of the problem with MTA was that it would sometimes wash out and it was difficult to handle and also cause staining. But MTA still is a good product for this technique. But in 2007 and 8, when the BC line of products came, uh, came out and were available, I worked with the uh, inventor to develop the BC putty primarily for the surgical lid technique. And the surgical lid technique is the concept of using this patented formula of the bioceramics, which is uh, the same basic formula across the BC sealer, BC original BC sealer, BC sealer high flow, RRM and RRM putty and now RRM fast set. It's the same basic calcium silicate, calcium phosphate based formula, which is unique and patented to BC sealer, by the way, uh, is, um, um, using two dissimilar uh, uh, consistencies of the material. I now use pri primarily the BC Sealer High Flow for the injectable um, portion of it. And that was inspired from my experiences as an undergraduate in dental school with the use of, uh, um, with the use of uh, you know, light body impression material and heavy body impression material, which we used in PROS before digital dentistry for you youngsters who don't realize the difficulties we have to go through. And th that concept follows now with the use of a light body sealer material followed by a heavy body um, um, putty material in this case the BC putty uh, fast set which is the one I recommend right now only for this technique because of the fact that it's not only faster set but also it is um, uh, has a, a far more resilience or resistance to wash out uh, afterwards. Now you don't have to wait for the putty to set which takes about 20 minutes for it to set. You don't have to wait for it because as soon as you put it it's actually tenacious enough and it's hydrophilic enough that it's not a problem with it washing out afterwards. So the idea is to use these um, uh, tips that are you know originally 10 millimeter. These are the uh, the, the, the surgical um, minimal waist tips that uh, I've done other videos on. And the idea is you trim it to the length that you want based on the tooth you're dealing with. So that goes all the way down to the base of this, this thing. And then you inject as you back out and you're kind of filling this space up with the syringable uh, BC sealer high flow at this point. And um, part of the reason I use the high flow is because high flow has smaller particle sizes. So it's a little easier to flow around that 90 degree bent needle. There's no clogging of it. And at the same time, it also has a little more zirconia, so you can see a little bit better the contrast between the gutta percha and the retrofill, which is kind of important at times to just kind of make sure you have uh, where is your filling and how deep that filling is. Once you fill the whole thing, you can sometimes end up with a little bit of dome, and then you take a little ball of the putty. I used to make this into a cone shape originally, and then I realized it's not necessary. And as you know, I am such a Occam's razor type of a guy, which, you know, if A is enough is unnecessary. I don't like to complicate things, keep things as simple as possible. I realized that just turning into a little ball and then placing it inside so that you end up with a little bit of flash 360 degrees around this retro preparation is adequate so that you can get a very nice seal. Once you've put that and you have a little bit of excess out, then you take a little micro brush and these little um, micro brush tips that are kind of bristles. And what this will do is it will, you will basically, once you are, have your retro fill and you have these little flash areas out here, you take the micro brush and then you walk it along the dentinal surface around the retro preparation. And the idea is that you're scrubbing those little flash areas of the bioceramic putty off and then you follow that up with rinsing. So you're almost like using water to, you, you brush and then you rinse out. And that's essentially what we did here. And you can see very quickly now, with this technique, within 10 seconds, you can do your retrofill. So as a result, you don't need to have to use a lot of caustic hemostatic agents that cause post-operative pain for your patients. You're far more efficient in your treatment and you're able to get the same exact results, but much faster. So that's the essence of efficiency where you're not compromising on the uh, efficacy and the quality of your work, but you're achieving fast results. Now, at the beginning, when I described this back in 2008, people were like, well, what are your scientific results? What are you showing? Now, after 13 years of having done this, I had one of my, uh, uh, one of the pre-doc students at our school come into uh, my office and pull about uh, 300 and some uh, cases of single uh, rooted uh, 
apicoectomy with retrofills that were done using the lid technique over the past 10 years and do this 10 year calling these people up and find out how many of them still had the teeth and did they have any symptoms. So we also managed to get a bunch of them who were able to come in to take x-rays to confirm healing, but we also uh, managed to get uh, about a hundred and some of them uh, on the phone and asked them if they still had the tooth and the way it's symptomatic or not. And we ended up having about 92, a little bit more than 92% of these patients still had their tooth and they were uh, asymptomatic. So that, that just goes to show that the success rate over this 10 year period was very high and it's comparable to other studies that have been done using far more complicated techniques. So I feel like when we here at Rebuild Endo kind of developed the hydraulic condensation technique, the promise here was that we're gonna simplify and make the process of obturation more efficient. And also the same thing goes here with this lid technique for surgery. The concept here is that we're using the modern material science to rethink and innovate the concepts of what we're trying to achieve, but much more efficiently. And that's what this lid, surgical lid technique is. It's the combining of these two um, different consistency by ceramic materials to achieve far faster retrofilling with the same still results as the older, much more complicated techniques. So here we finish this up and you can see that that's the uh, tooth, that um, that's the final retrofill. And now we go in and I do just some interrupted sutures here and uh, actually do a couple of sling sutures. It's interesting to do a reverse sling suture, putting the sling on the buckle aspect. I use gut sutures because they kind of fall off on their own and usually we want them to fall off within a week and that's fast enough, just regular gut. Place pressure on the flap to kind of uh, remove any coagulum between the flap and the, the bone. And here is how we started originally. We did a retreatment and then we did the apicoectomy. And you can see that we did cut the root pretty short, but uh, uh, six months follow-up shows us that the area has healed completely patient safe symptomatic. And I actually asked about the post-op uh, symptoms that he went through and the healing period. Did he have a lot of pain or swelling? And he absolutely had no pain or swelling. And he said he the, the post-op was kind of unremarkable, which is totally fine. That's what we want. And you can see here that we go from uh, earlier six months and six months later and we can see that uh, we have uh, great healing at this point and we're going to follow up with this patient to see a one-year recall and take another CBCT and see how he does. Now surgery is a big component of my practice. My office is called microsurgical endo. We do a lot of apicoectomies. Now over the past uh, decade that I've been sharing videos with you, I've been focusing primarily more on the non-surgical aspects of endo and hydraulic condensation, the techniques that we at Rebuild Endo have developed for you guys to help simplify and streamline the process. But surgery is a big part of my practice. I and mean, in fact, my assistants generally tell me that they prefer it when we do surgery than we do non-surgical cases, because surgical cases are so much more efficient and much more quicker and they go very quickly. And uh, that's primarily due to the lid technique. And uh, I mean, I have done thousands of surgical cases as well. Uh, I am now the director of the uh, surgical program uh, for endo at our, uh, at our school for the postdocs at endo. And all of us use the lid technique. Of course, we teach them, teach the residents all of the techniques, but they tend to gravitate towards the lid technique because everybody wants to do a more efficient technique as long as we can get the good results. And we have been getting the good results as we can see now. So that's it. I just want to share with you this, uh, this case. I will share more uh, surgical cases with you guys in the future. In fact, I'm in the process of trying to put together some type of a surgical program as well with our lecture and hands-on courses. We do a lot of lecture and hands-on courses around the country and uh, in North America, but I feel like there's also a lot of demand for learning how to do surgery. And I'd like to do a few of those courses, lecture hands-on courses for you guys as well because of all the demand and, 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 and the, um, emails and so on that I've received from you. If you are interested in that, let me know and I will do put together a few of those courses for you guys at different uh, centers like the course that I do for our postdocs at, uh, at Harvard. Having said that, I hope you've had all a great Labor Day as I have here in New Hampshire. Beautiful uh, weather we're having and uh, until the next video for Rebuild Endo, I'm Ali Nese and let's save some teeth.